we're going to talk about development. And on this stage in here, I would like to ask to ready to get ready for to dive in to a world of sustainable software development with our next speakers, the eco-friendly code crusaders from Helmes, Heiki Nagel and Kaspar Ginziver. Hi. So guys, are you ready to rock the stage? Of course. You had some ideas to what you want to do before to get them like all pumped <laughs> up. How is your energy? Is it okay? Okay, nice. I it's think we good. can work with that. Have fun. Thanks. Hello. My name is Kaspar Ginsiver, this is Heiti Nagel, we are from Helmes as already said and we are here to talk to you about software and more precisely green software. Yes, hello, I'm Heiki, we are from Helmes and Helmes is digital innovation and software development powerhouse and we are leading the green software initiative in the Baltics. We have been on the market for more than 30 years and with uh, more than 1,400 people, we have uh, developed business critical software for large companies in Estonia and all over the world. And with that time, we have experienced two big misconceptions that people have about green software and sustainable software. First one of them being that software carbon footprint is negligible or that all software is already fully optimized. Now, second misconception is that doing green software means it's slower, more expensive, more complicated, and harder to use. Cut. So, let's dig deeper in the first misconception that software is sustainable by default. Software is something that we usually don't see around us. Maybe we see mostly uh, software that is running in our end-user devices like laptops, uh, tablets, smartphones, but there's a whole lot world, whole wide world of uh, other software that we don't perceive that well. And unfortunately, this has a considerable emissions coming from it and then the in 2022, ICT emissions made up to 5% of the world's emission. That's a huge amount. It's equal to whole transportation, and it's more than whole aviation sector in combined. I'm afraid it's not getting any better either, because by 2030, it's estimated that 13% of world's electricity will be spent on ICT sector. ICT sector is the fastest growing sector in the world and it needs its own green transformation. But, but let's see what, where this ICT footprint comes from. There's a whole lot of different uh, categories like networking, data centers, end-user devices, and software itself stands at 18%. 18% is the software that we don't see that well, that is uh, in, in different sectors, but uh, software is also within all the other categories as well. Let's take the end-user devices. 75% of the emissions coming from end-user devices is manufacturing, transportation and disposal. 25 of it is actual usage. And if we talk about end user devices, then usage is mainly software that we run in our laptops and smartphones and tablets. Coming back to the green transformation, uh, are we saying that uh, we should not use digital solutions and go back to non-digital? No, we are not saying that. Digital solutions have much less emissions or, or impact in the world than the non-digital solutions. So we are not saying that you should go back from digital and you should not digitalize your solutions and systems. What we are actually saying is that you should make it in a better way. If we take the digital solutions and make them in correct way and optimize the digital solutions we have or we plan to build, 
then we can lower the emissions dramatically. And that's where the green transformation in ICT lies. And ICT needs its green transformation like any other sector. What there is to gain from this green transformation? The gain is huge. If we build our solutions in green way, the electricity consumption can be lower as much as 100 times, and we can reduce the data waste up to 1,000 times. This is a huge change. Thank you, Heikin. Thank you, Gaspar. So this was the first misconception. Now let's turn to the second one. The second one was that doing software in a green way means it's more costly, more complicated, harder to run, and so on. Luckily, this is not the case. Lately, there was a study done by Accenture, which is one of the biggest IT companies in the world. And they found out that companies were able to align their business, technology, and sustainability goals. They can actually achieve better business results. Namely, increased business growth. This is due to the fact that they are more effective in what they do. And also, market demands it, because sustainability is more understandable for their customers. Secondly, it's easier to hire people, especially top talent, because top talent knows that being sustainable is being sexy. Increased innovation. Uh, innovation doesn't happen if you have abundance of resources and you can continue the old way of doing business. It happens when you introduce constraints, and this change definitely adds some constraints on how we do software. And as software is a big part of most companies' business processes these days, of course, there is seen positive effect on their ESG metrics, which is kind of proving the point that we're talking about here today. Now, talking about that, you might think that uh, doing things in a green way means that you have to do extra and you have to do more. Usually, that's not the case. Just to have to do it professionally, keep the green mindset uh, in, in, in the picture and do things the right way and effective way. Let me share you one tool that we are using in Helmes to make this ESG more understandable to people and to companies. It's quite hard to remember, and at first I always messed up what this ESG stands for. I started like in environmental, sustain, and yeah, not sustainability, but uh, social and then governance. So we translated to people, business, and planet the three pillars that you have to think about when you are making decisions and balance them on that scale. That means that the outcome will most likely be as sustainable as possible. Now, doing software in a sustainable way, it's not only the coders' work, the developers' work. It's actually full team's work, and everybody has to think about it in every phase of the project. So business leader, they have to set the culture and explain the value of green software to the clients, to partners, to subcontractors. Team leader has to agree on, uh, on the way of working within the team and together with the customer. Uh, they have to make sure that everybody in the team has the needed green knowledge. Now, analysts and designers, uh, they work very closely with the business people, and they have to know the right question to ask and also to influence the business people because the business person who is ordering the software, they might not know what kind of impact the thing that they're ordering will have on the planet. Then architects, they need to understand the system, the way it can grow, the way that business can grow. Then they can uh, propose green alternatives and also design the system as a whole. Now we come to the actual coding. So tech leads, developers, and also testers, they need to agree on a green way of writing software and how to make sure that it was actually followed through. And people who monitor the software in action, in production, 
Well, they used to mainly monitor when extra disk space is needed, or extra memory or computing power. But they also have to monitor when is excessive data being generated and uh, where would be optimization places, and turn back to the development team to change the software when it's needed. Kaspar. Heike, Heike covered the green mindset that green developer development team, which is where it all, all begins. But green software stands on, on three actual pillars from technical point of view that all make sense and are rather simple, but yet they make huge impact. Let's take them one by one. First of all, keep it simple. If we drill down our business processes or the problems that we seek to solve with our software solution, if we simplify it as, as much as possible, then it takes less resources to solve that problem. And the less resources our system needs to solve this problem, the more sustainable it is. It's simple. The second one that um, is, I would say, even most important part of green software is the data. Today's world, data is everywhere around us. And I might say even that world is data-driven, actually, because there's everywhere, and the data is going everywhere. And if we want to make our solution green, we have to take a deep look at the data that we are handling or processing. And looking at it from the point that what kind of data we actually need to serve our business process or, or problem, how much of that data we need, how long we should keep that data, and which kind of data we need if we talk about size. Let's take, um, I don't know, pictures, videos, images, uh, animations. The size can be vastly different. Data is one of the biggest uh, part of sustainable software or, or green software because it has huge impact, because it has to be stored somewhere, and all these things that store this data and process this data take resources, which make it, as more data you have, less sustainable it is. And this brings to us to the third pillar of efficiency. If we build our system or solution, we can make it in very different ways. The same problem can be solved very different ways. You can just basically throw everything you have if you have vast amount of resources added and the problem, problem will eventually be solved. Or what you can do, you can build your solution well, efficient way, and then solving the exact same problem takes much less electricity. Let's see. Thank you, Gaspar. So we heard what is the software carbon footprint why it is important to think about doing green software. And the next question you might ask is, but what can my company do? What can I personally do? So first, start with KPIs. You probably have green KPIs present already in your company, I hope. Uh, now the next step is to make sure that software is also covered by them. And when you're making business decisions, then uh, consider the software implications or the part of software will have in these uh, decisions. Next one is uh, sustainable partners. Source your software from them. Many companies are still figuring out uh, what this change is all about. So if, if you want a sustainable partner, make sure that they have already implemented the sustainable software development tools. They are measuring themselves internally. Uh, this is part of their uh, value proposition and they understand the impact that their company and their work is, uh, is having. And good but old 80-20 rule. Don't start to change everything at once. That probably isn't sustainable. But find the areas with most impact. Start with those and always keep in mind that the new things that you're developing, that they are green, and then gradually phase out the older and not that effective tools. And you personally, uh, I visited the uh, Roheböre podcast also, we talked about that uh, more there. But the short version is that use your cell phone a few years longer, don't switch it out every year or in every two years. And also, as Kasper said, control your data. 
delete the videos, delete the photos that you don't need, and make sure that they are not backed up in five different places. If there's, like, we covered green mindset, we covered green development team and some of the te more technical details of green software. But if there's one thought that we want you to take away from this keynote, is that solve the right problem. And what we mean by that is, if you start developing a software solution or you start using one, you should think about whether any of the functionalities that is present or you seek to develop, and does it actually serve your business or your personal problem? Do you actually need it and, and do you, does it provide value for you? If it doesn't, then don't develop it. Don't use it because useless software is always a waste. Yes, and if you want to hear more, if you want to discuss and, uh, and ask questions, you are welcome to visit our booth. We are on the first floor for the both days. And also me and Kasper, we're going to have a workshop today, 3.30, in the Sepigoya Gallery. And we're going to talk more about the three pillars of green software development there. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Actually, I have a question. Yeah. Um, usually when companies come up with like new ideas or new initiatives, there's always pushback. There's always the non-believers who go like, ah, this will never work, this is blah, blah, blah. Can you share a story or do you have a story from a person who was very like, like negligent and uh, no, this is not going to work for me and at the end turned out to be, wow, a fan? Mm. Maybe it's not a long story, but I have had uh, several cases where this uh, second misconception is in play. That, okay, if we do it green, then it will be more complicated, expensive and slower and so on. But when you show people that it will be faster, use less resource, you have to pay more in the following, or pay less in the following years, then it's everybody's on board usually after that. And I mean, the positivity works as well, the enthusiasm <laughs> from the message bringer, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, thank you guys for the presentation, and uh, if you guys are interested, then uh, they will be waiting for you at the booth. So, a round of applause. All right.